Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. Today's topic, really important topic, Paul, do I have a blood clot? Serious topic. It's, yeah, potentially life-threatening, actually. Can be fatal. And relates to a lot of stuff. So not only to our jobs as orthopedic surgeons, but also more recently with some of the conversations about the vaccine. So we're going to talk generically yeah. about blood clots. We're going to talk, uh, talk on the vaccine stuff, too? Maybe a little bit. Okay, okay. Kay. So, blood clot. What's a blood clot? Well, blood's supposed to clot, right? If you cut Thank yourself, goodness. you bleed, yep. and then you eventually clot uh, to stop the bleeding. So it's called hemostasis, right? Right. And there's a lot of mechanisms inside the blood that enable it to clot. Intrinsic, extrinsic factors within the blood that allow it to clot so you don't bleed to death when you get a bleeding nose. It's going back to med school. There's a lot of pathways that well, I remember learning. We're done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if we had a hematologist here, we would go into great detail. But it's actually not particularly important for what's happening today in our conversation. So we're talking about more pathological or abnormal formations of a blood clot that have potentially serious consequences. So we're not talking about a blood clot in your skin. We're talking about a blood clot in your vessels. And there are really two kinds of vessels. So there are arteries and veins. And clots in the arteries and veins cause really different problems. Absolutely. Okay. Where well, do you want to start? I think the most the, the thing that pertains to us most is yes. the blood clot that occurs in the deep veins of the leg. Yes. Okay, and those those blood clots are called thro a thrombosis. Okay. Yes. And uh, in the deep veins of the leg, it's called a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. Yes, common layman term for a blood clot in your leg. DVT. DVT. So, and is a DVT a big deal if you get a blood clot in your leg, in the veins of your leg? So I'd say generally speaking, actually a DVT is not a big deal. So it can cause some local pain, can cause some swelling, but the DVT becomes a more uh, serious problem when it becomes mobile. Yeah. So if a, I always tell patients, like if a piece breaks off and goes, and the veins uh, go go back to your heart, and from your heart they go to your lungs. Right. And if you get a, p a piece of that thrombosis goes to the lungs, then it's called a pulmonary embolus. Yeah, and which is potentially life-threatening. Um, so let's back it up a little bit. So when blood leaves your heart, it goes down through arteries. So theoretically, you get a clot in your artery, and that leads to things like heart attacks and strokes. We talked about that in our cardiology series. With Dr. Heffernan, yeah, we explained mm -hmm. that. So as then as the blood goes out through your whole body and distributes oxygen and nutrients to your tissues, then as the oxygen is extracted, it puts carbon dioxide back into your blood and then it comes back all these veins but it goes to your to the left to the right side of your heart sorry and then to your lungs and a lot of people are like well if I get a blood clot does it actually go into my heart well usually it can't it can't get through the filter of your lungs that's why it gets stuck in your lungs and that's why you get a pulmonary well, it must have passed through on the right side to get to the lungs exactly um, but yeah you get you get a pulmonary embolus or a PE okay so who gets blood clots well blood clots they can happen anybody can have it it can happen yes. to you know, there is an incidence of it that occurs in the common population. Is it one in... One to two in a thousand. It's actually yeah. very common, just walking around. Yeah, you can get a blood clot. Uh, and then there are things that can put you at risk for a blood clot. Uh, so you can think of them as things that keep you immobilized for a while. Yep. Uh, so postoperatively. Surgery. That's the big one for us because I tell everybody uh, if I'm consenting someone for surgery, I say, well, you are at risk for getting a blood clot yeah. after, okay? So surgery, and we give you often some form of blood thinner, either mechanical or pharmaceutical to try and reduce the risk of a blood clot. But a post-operative course is definitely one of the bigger risk factors uh, for a blood clot. Yep, long flights. Long flights very, on a plane. Very common, people are always like, am I gonna get a blood clot? I'm mm -hmm. like, you could get a blood clot. You could get a blood clot in a plane. And the, the two things about being in a plane is one, you're immobile in a tight seat. I don't get to fly first class often, so I'm really cramped in there. Yep. Back in the day when we used to fly, uh, not so much now, but hopefully we'll get back to that one day. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is when you're up in a plane, the cabin pressure is a little bit lower than atmospheric pressure. So uh, the veins in your leg therefore dilate and blood pools in there a little bit more. And that's why if you take your shoes off on the plane, sometimes all of a sudden you're like, I can't get my shoe back on. Swelled up? Yeah, swelled up. So and that's the why guy some next to you is thinking, please <laughs> get your shoe, shoe back, back on. on. And that's why some people wear compression stockings on the plane mm -hmm. to help reduce the swelling and reduce the risk of a blood clot. There you go. Um, okay, so those are two uh, controllable kind of things that they cause blood clots. Um, and then you can, ha you can be predisposed to it because of some abnormal uh, mechanism in your 
uh, hemostasis pathway. If you have some sort of clotting disorder uh, that makes you clot more frequently, uh, then you are at increased risk as well. And the only way to know that is if you've had maybe a close family member that's had a history of blood clots or if you were actually tested. So unfortunately for some of those people, the first time you realize you have that is when you get a blood clot. Yeah. And they say, well, that's weird. You had no other risk factors. Let's do some tests. Yeah. Um, cancer is another one, unfortunately, cancer. that some people with certain types of cancers certainly can be hypercoagulable where they have a higher chance of uh, forming blood clots, which is a risk as well. Uh, yeah, and then there's uh, smoking is that puts you at increased risk and certain medications, yeah, particularly yeah. the birth control pill. Oral contraceptive pill can also put you at increased risk for blood clot, and that's a bad combo. Oral contraceptive pill and, and smoking, smoking on a plane after you've had surgery. <laughs> after you've had surgery. <laughs> you get the idea. Yes. Um, okay. So, what do you do? Well, how do they present? So, so if someone's just sitting at home and like, I think I might have a blood clot. What? What are they? Why would they think that? Well, uh, if it's in your leg. One thing, we always talk about calf tenderness, yep. okay? Soreness in the calf, very tender uh, and abnormal amount of swelling, which is tricky because you do get swelling after surgery in sure. your leg if you had a hip replacement or a knee replacement, but kind of an abnormal amount of tense swelling can be an indication of a... If you look at it, Paul, does the leg look any different? Um, no, no, it's hard to tell by looking at it. Usually, I usually just examine the calf and, and palpate yeah. it and see if it hurts when I squeeze the calf. Maybe a little bit red, but that's certainly not. You could have a normal looking, normal looking skin and you might not be able to tell. And if it has gone to your lung, now you've got some symptoms. Yeah, so what do you, so those people, what are they showing up with? They're showing up with some chest pain. Yep. Shortness of breath. Yeah. Rapid heart rate. Rapid heart rate, right. Um, okay, so you have some of these symptoms and you may have a history or something that's predisposing you, so you're worried that you have a blood clot. What should you do? Get to the emergency room yeah. or your doctor or urgent care center, somewhere fast. Particularly on the lung side. So if you have the chest pain, shortness of breath, fast heart rate, definitely that's probably more of an ER visit. 911 even. If, yeah, maybe 911. If you have a sore calf and a little bit of swelling, that might be a family doctor visit. But again, that would have to be determined by you and the severity of your situation. So you get there, so you get to the ER mm -hmm. and you explain your symptoms and your story. What's the doctor gonna do after they take a history and physical? They do a history and physical examination, we always say that. Um, and then of course, if there's been some history of trauma or something, they might do an X-ray yep. as well. Um, but uh, the key for the diagnosis of the DVT or the deep vein thrombosis is an ultrasound investigation of that limb. Right. An ultrasound is just a, a test that allows us to assess the amount of flow mm -hmm. through a tube, like one of your veins. Mm -hmm. And if it shows that that vein is obstructed with something there, typically a clot, mm -hmm. that's how it becomes diagnostic. Yeah. And the way they do it is they, they look for compressibility of the vein. If you push on it, does the vein compress? Because compress the, the walls of a vein are, are very soft. A vein will squish easily because the pressure in a vein is very low. So you see if it compresses. If it doesn't compress, that means there's uh, there could be a blood clot in there. And then, as Dr. Weening said, you can also look for flow. And the only way we can use ultrasound to look for flow is using uh, Doppler ultrasound. Special kind. Doppler is just, uh, we're going to go back to physics here now. <laughs> Doppler, Hans Christian Doppler, yes. Austrian physicist, found that the frequency shift in sound waves is proportional to the velocity of the thing that the sound bounced off of. So it bounces off the blood vessels, uh, it bounces off the blood vessel wall and it bounces off the red blood cells and they can, they can see flow from ultrasound by looking at a frequency shift in the ultrasound signal they sent out and bounced back. Did you like that? I apologize for Dr. Zalda being an engineer. <laughs> he just went back into engineering mode. I love that um, stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Flow is, flow is an important part of engineering and physics for sure. Yeah. Reminds us of when our kids are doing physics homework. Yeah. Um, okay, so you got the ultrasound. Are there any other tests? Uh, Say you're higher on the PE worry. We're worried about a, a blood clot that's gone to your lungs. Okay, yeah. Well, on, this, on the uh, investigation side of things, you can get some imaging, uh, fancy imaging yep. of the lungs, and that is a... So a CT angio or a, a special type of CT scan of your chest or a spiral CT, sometimes yeah. they can do it more quickly. CT angiogram is just a CT that looks at the blood vessels around an area <coughs> and the spiral CT is just a very high high um, resolution CT. So We used to do VQ scans. I don't think they do them anymore, which it was a test oh, where they yeah. looked at the amount of blood that perfused the lung. And essentially what happens is if you get a clot that goes to your lung, it's kind of like 
that part of the lung gets blocked off, so yeah, it doesn't right. have proper blood flow. Yeah. Remember we used yeah. to do those all the time? Yeah, yeah. But I think it's because CT was not readily available. Yeah. Now, even the smallest hospitals often have a CT now, so I yeah. think it's it's faster and I think it's more useful. I forgot useful about test. the VQ the scan. VQ scan, yeah. yeah. Old school. Yeah. A bit of history of medicine. Here. There you go. Okay, so now you have a PE. Wait, or, you know, one more test okay. you can do, blood test. There's a oh, blood yes. test you can do. Okay. D-dimer. A D-dimer blood test. Is that a good test, Paul? Uh, I think it's not very uh, specific. Maybe sensitive, but it's not very specific. You gotta pull it together with the story and the exam yeah. and all the yeah. tests that can help lean you one Especially way or the other. Especially in the post-operative period, I think your D-dimer is gonna be up, because it's just showing like products of blood clots and things, and obviously you've got blood clots going on where you're supposed to have them around a surgical incision. Right. So a D-dimer might throw you off. Okay, okay, there you go. So you're positive for a DVT or a PE. Now what? Okay, uh, send you on home. Yeah. Good luck with your blood clot. Yeah, here, here, here. Now you know you got a blood clot. Well, now we gotta treat it in some way. Right. Uh, so, the, the mainstay of treatment is some sort of pharmacologic agent that thins the blood. Uh, we say okay, thins wait, wait. the blood. So you're not going to burst this clot for me? You're not going to give me a medication to burst it? No. We no. don't really burst uh, vein clots. Right. We just, and, and we don't, we can't really, to be honest, cure them or get rid of them, but we want to stop it from progressing. Right. So it's, yeah, it's some sort of, what we call blood thinners, I mean, uh, it's not really thinning the blood, but it's really making the blood less uh, able to clot. Right, because you don't want that clot that's blocking a small vessel to block a bigger vein and become keep a bigger growing. problem. Yeah, keep right. growing, keep growing. Okay, so you go with blood thinner. So when we're talking, there's a many different categories from aspirin up to very, very strong um, medications. Do I take this for like a couple of days? So you're gonna be on that for a while. That's gonna be, and that you're gonna determine with your uh, family doc, internal medicine doc, or even your hematologist in some centers. And it's going to be on the order of months now that you're going to be taking that. Yeah, like certainly three to six and potentially mm -hmm. a year, depending on if you've had it before or the severity of the clot or your symptoms or whatever, and especially if you had a PE. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's minimum six months. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you have some underlying condition that predisposes you to it, you may right. be on it for, for life. life. Yeah, people don't love that. Mm, or if you get them without any predisposing factors yep. uh, frequently, and even though you haven't identified sort of a, anything in your system that causes them, then you might be on them for life as well. Right. But they're uh, usually oral medications, so it's not. It's better than it used yeah. to be, because yeah. we used to have to inject everybody, and yeah. or they injected themselves, and the people didn't, yeah. didn't, didn't like that either. Um, so now you're on medication. Anything else that, that you would do after? Uh, well, you try and modify those risk factors. You know, right. definitely if you're smoking, you're going to quit okay. smoking. Uh, and uh, a level of mobility after surgery if you're in the post-operative period. Or trauma too. We, we didn't really mention that as a potential cause. But yeah, if you break your ankle, break your leg, even if you're in a cast, sort of that immobile leg, which is a big part of our practice, yeah. um, those people are potentially at risk depending on the location and the duration of your immobility. So that's also something to consider. Um, so modifying those. What, do you, what are your thoughts on compression stockings? I think compression stockings are a reasonable option, especially if someone has some uh, venous insufficiency, so the veins in their legs aren't working as well as they should be. Right. Um, compression stockings just try and uh, reduce the amount of blood pooling that can occur. Right, because veins have one-way valves that slowly start to work less effectively over time. So as that pools, that compression stocking can work almost like the muscles that are surrounding all of your veins that push that blood back to your, back to your heart. All right. We, we did mention we were talking about vaccines. Yeah, so this is a really, really hot topic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for some of the vaccines more than others, we don't have to, well, we will name them. You know what? We didn't. So there's evidence to show that AstraZeneca vaccine and the J&J &J vaccine have a slightly higher risk of potentially being related to blood clots. Mm -hmm. And this is in the order of, so normally, like we talked about, one to two people in a thousand are just walking around and are going to get a blood clot. So that's the incidence just in the community. And it goes to about one, the incidence with the vaccine is about one in 30,000 or one in 40,000. So it's very small. Right. And it makes it hard to find when if you have one in 40,000 and of that 40,000, you probably already have 40 people that have blood clots. Yeah. But there definitely is some association, much less frequently with the mRNA vaccines. Um, and they don't exactly know why. It's, it's a different kind of blood clot. It, they label it VITT, where you actually have um, a clot that's related to thrombus, uh, having uh, less platelets than normal, which is odd. Um, but there's not much that you can do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and some people say, well, is this enough of a reason for me not to get the vaccine? Well, we always look at risk-benefit ratios when we decide on a medical treatment. And yep. for the vaccine in specific, uh, for the vast majority of people, 
uh, the risk-benefit ratio favors getting the vaccine. I'm sorry if there are some people here who are against vaccines and you don't like hearing that, but yeah. definitely the risk-benefit ratio for the majority of people, uh, uh, across, if you look at a cross-section of society, it benefits uh, getting the vaccine because the risk is so small. And that's what the hematologists say. So, so yes, obviously if you had a specific risk factor or had a family history, then you have to discuss that with your family doctor or hematologist to, to weigh the risk specifically for you and, and kind of categorize them. But generally speaking, yes, the risk of getting a blood clot, A, in the community is higher, and B, the risk once you get COVID actually goes up eight times. So mm -hmm. COVID itself can link to, to um, blood clot. So mm -hmm. um, in general, um, saying that you don't want to get the vaccine because of a blood clot, despite being normal to be afraid of blood clots, is not really backed by science. Yeah, but now you've yeah. probably, you probably never thought of blood clots before, but probably now you may have heard the word more and more because of the vaccines and yeah. that, and that, and that, I'm not going to say controversy, that, uh, reality, reality. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so definitely just keep in mind, uh, if you've had the vaccine or you're thinking of getting the vaccine or you're going to get the vaccine, your risk of blood clot is very, 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 very small. Yeah, and doctors even said lots of people have come to the ER or to their family doctor concerned about blood clots. Having said that, uh, very, very few of them have blood clots and of the people that do get them, uh, the vast majority do get better. So hopefully this video has helped. Yes, if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. We'll see you next time.